Good evening, everyone, on another cold, blustery winter day, but not too cold for these brave young souls on Lake of the Isles. And take heart, it should warm up for the weekend. For all the news of the day, from Washington to Minnesota, Newsnight Minnesota is next. From Twin Cities Public Television, this is Newsnight Minnesota, a statewide program of news, analysis, and commentary. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Newsnight. Good evening. Glad you could join us again tonight. Coming up on tonight's show, Mr. Gutnet goes to Washington. The freshman Republican representative talks live with us about the new order of things. Then another notable politician, Minneapolis Mayor Sharon Sales Belton. She joins us to talk about her first year in office and the search for a new chief of police. Then a rip-roaring ride through the new production of Don Juan Giovanni. And on the continuing arts theme, an interview with Rebecca Peterson, just named recipient of the Sally Ordway Irvine Award for her work in the arts community. Those stories and interviews in a moment, but first, some of the headlines of the day. Carson Perry Scott is out, Mervyn's is in. In a deal announced today, Mervyn's, a moderately priced apparel chain owned by Minneapolis-based Dayton Hudson, will buy eight of the nine Carson stores located in Minnesota for $74 million. Only the Carson store in Rochester will remain. Seven of the other eight Carsons will become Mervyn's. And the Dayton's at Ridgedale will take over the existing Carson Perry Scott store there. That means Dayton's will be competing against the Dayton's own Mervyn's. But the stores do cater to different demographics. The deal should be completed by March. And in a related note, Dayton Hudson announced today that its sales rose 9.6% for the past year. Well, the Minneapolis chapter of the NAACP has a new president, Bill Davis. He's been active in the organization for about 20 years now and says his first goal is to increase the membership from 600 to 1,500. Mayor Sharon Sales Belton was on hand to swear in Davis as well as other new board members and officers. The Minneapolis chapter will host the national NAACP conference this coming July. The Mille Lacs Band of Chippewa plans to limit winter spearfishing, agreeing to a request by the State Department of Natural Resources. The band could spearfish in open water off its reservation land, but has agreed to fish only in lakes which have frozen over. The state DNR says that this agreement means that the spearfishing will not adversely impact the fish population. Well, yesterday we brought you uh, some of the opening scenes of the 104th Congress in Washington. Congratulations. The gentlemen and gentlewomen are now members of the 104th time. Well, one of the gentlemen there enjoying all of that hoopla, in fact, one who helped to bring about the changing of the guard, Gil Gutnick, freshman representative from Minnesota's 1st District. He's here now to tell us about uh, what's gone on so far within the Beltway. Thanks for joining us tonight. First of all, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. I'm okay. Clear. First of all, give us your reaction just to being there in Washington during this time of so much transition and change. Well, it's, it's certainly an exciting time to be here in Washington. I think Hobart Rowan, uh, a columnist here in Washington, said a couple of weeks ago that this is probably the most historic time in Washington since 1933. And uh, I think most of the people in this city understand that we're going to see a, a tremendous change. And, of course, that change began yesterday. What are some of the things that you actually have accomplished within the last 24 hours? I know you guys have been uh, awake quite a long time. <laughs> well, yeah, in fact, I was just thinking about it. I got back to my room last night at about 2.30, uh, or I should say this morning at 2.30, uh, and the day began early yesterday with a uh, prayer service uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And as you may know, I was followed around uh, most of the day, in fact, the last couple of days by a film crew from CNN and uh, with all the other events we had about 50 uh, family and friends out here uh, it, it was an extremely busy day and and I think of course what the uh, the voters want to know is that uh, we essentially did accomplish what they sent us here to do and what we promised we would do on the first day in terms of changing the way Congress does business and, and reforming uh, uh, some of the rules of Congress. You've got 99 days left in these first hundred days uh, what are some of the big things left for you and the Republicans in that uh, contract with America in the first 100 days? Well, I think some of the easier uh, issues have now been resolved. You know, yesterday uh, we promised that we would make Congress live by the same rules as everybody else. Uh, that was certainly high on the agenda for yesterday, so we, we've accomplished that. We said we would downsize the Congress. We would, would limit the number of committees. We would cut the amount of staff. We would limit the terms of uh, 
of the chairman of some of those committees. Uh, we would change the way the Congress actually sets up it bu its budget so that uh, a, uh, a budget cut will actually be a budget cut. And when we increase a budget, it will actually show as an increase. You know, Washington accounting used to show uh, some increases as actual cuts. If you cut the uh, projected increase, uh, they called that a cut here in, uh, in Washington. Uh, we also said that we were going to audit the House's books and we we're going to open up the process so that both the committee and the subcommittee meetings now will be open to the public. That's what we promised we would do on the first day, and, and I'm happy to report to the voters in the state of Minnesota uh, we've kept that promise. Uh, some of the tougher issues coming, though, will be uh, relative to welfare reform. Uh, we've promised to change the way uh, we do the welfare system, and that's going to be a, a very controversial issue. Uh, we talked about making a stronger national defense. That's going to be a tough issue. And as you go through the rest of the contract, uh, they're not going to be easy issues to resolve, but uh, uh, we've given it our, our word that we're going to give it our best effort to get those issues to the floor of the House and have an honest vote under open rules from, from here on out. And I'm interested. I think we're going to do our best to live up to our end of the agreement. I'm interested, uh, Mr. Gutnick, just in your first personal impression walking into Congress as a freshman and uh, what was it like and how did it compare, for instance, to your time at the, the state legislature? Well, to be honest, it, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't quite the emotional feeling to me uh, it being uh, sworn in for the first time as a member of Congress as there was when I first went to the Minnesota legislature. It, it, it didn't seem like as big a jump as from coming literally from uh, the private sector into the state legislature. So I'd been preparing uh, literally uh, for about a dozen years uh, for, for yesterday. But it still uh, began to strike me, especially after yesterday's uh, prayer service that we had, uh, the, the final uh, song was sung by a black choir, and they sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And when they did, it sort of struck me that uh, in just a few hours, uh, I said to myself as I left the church, you know, in a few hours, I'm going to take the same oath of office that Abraham Lincoln took about 135 years ago. And uh, literally, we are going to change history uh, beginning at, at 12 noon. And so I think from that point on, I think the dimensions of what was about to happen uh, began to sink in. But before that, we've been uh, really too busy to even really think about it. We uh, don't want to let you go before we ask about that block of wood there that we understand is a part <laughs> of Minnesota. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes, uh, I, I wasn't quickly. particularly pleased with the sound of the, of the gavel when I first came here and heard uh, the sort of tink, tink, tink sound. And, and I'd always uh, found the, the sound of the gavel in the Minnesota House to be uh, rich and, and full. And so uh, I took it upon myself to have one made identical to the one we use in the, in the uh, Minnesota House. And I gave it to Newt Gingrich yesterday morning. And uh, he had several gavels and several tone blocks. He did use it when he first uh, uh, took the, uh, the rostrum as Speaker of the House and used it for most of the day. Uh, then he substituted for the old one uh, later in the day when it began to bounce around too much, and he said he's going to try and get some rubber pads so it, it doesn't bounce around so much. But I think uh, most of the people who had a chance to hear it uh, found that it, it did have a much richer sound, and it, and it gave more authority to the speaker. So hopefully he'll keep using it from here on out. <laughs> well, listen, uh, up until the block of wood, we had been talking about some very serious issues that you will have to tackle this year. But tell us, are you having fun while you're there so far? Uh, really, I, I'm having so much fun, I sometimes have to wonder why they pay us to come out here. Uh, uh, it, it's been a great experience, um, and, uh, you know, I'm one of the luckiest people you'll ever get a chance to meet because I'm one of the few people, I think, that, that really gets to do what he really likes to do. And, and I'm so thankful and fortunate uh, and especially appreciative of the people in the First District for giving me this chance. Uh, even if I only get one term, I'm going to try and make the most of it. Well, thank you for joining us. And, of course, you know we will be checking in and keeping a watch on what you guys are doing. Well, thank you. Thanks. From the national political scene to the local, today Mayor Sharon Sales Belton asked for some help from the public to name the new Minneapolis Chief of Police. Community-oriented policing should also include community-oriented hiring. So today we are opening up a community comment line to give citizens of our community an opportunity to participate in part in the selection of the new chief. Mayor Sales Belton joins us live uh, on this evening, the one year anniversary of your taking office, yes. to talk about not only the search for the new police chief, but other things in that first year. Mayor, uh, where are you exactly in, in the search for the chief? I know there are applicants, you have a committee. Uh, where does it stand? Well, on October 28th, uh, we named a citizen uh, committee uh, to uh, help uh, me in the uh, search process for the chief of police. That uh, citizen committee is headed up by one of our uh, local business uh, leaders, uh, Larry Perlman from Ceridian. 
Uh, since the community uh, committee has been established, uh, we have sought the uh, help of a professional police search firm, and uh, that uh, firm has helped us generate over uh, 30 uh, plus uh, applicants uh, from across the country. We also have some local and some regional uh, candidates. Uh, most recently, uh, the committee pared that down to about uh, 12 people. They're going to start uh, interviews of those 12 uh, in about a week. And uh, by the end of the month, uh, they're going to present me with uh, four finalists. Any internal candidates among those? There were uh, internal candidates uh, who were in the uh, pool of, uh, of um, 30 plus. And uh, there's likely to be uh, some uh, internal candidates uh, in, uh, in the group that are going to be interviewed. Is it, is it more difficult to find applicants based on the experiences that Chief Locks at least claimed he had, the frustrations he had in the final months? And has, well, we, that made, has that made it more difficult? We uh, hired uh, the Police Executive Research uh, Forum to help us with this uh, chief process. And one of the things that uh, their consultant has said to us is that people were reluctant to come to the Minneapolis area for three reasons. One, weather, which some days I can understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, two, salary. The salaries for police chiefs, uh, particularly on either coast, are a lot higher than uh, what we pay here in the Midwest and here in Minneapolis in particular. And then the third thing is that some of them express concern about uh, the uh, structure of uh, government uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis and the fact that the police chief had to be responsive to 14 uh, individual bosses as opposed to one. And uh, that kept some people from applying. Okay, that's certainly one thing that Chief Locks, uh, former Chief uh, Locks, talked about. He didn't feel he had enough control. Is that something that may be changed, or whoever it is that comes up next, they're going to have to adhere to it? Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, these things are prescribed uh, by charter. They do give uh, the mayor a little bit more authority, but the policy uh, issues uh, that, uh, that the police department has to work through and with really are uh, monitored uh, by members of the city council and a city council policy committee. So those are the realities until the uh, citizens of our community decide that we need a new and different structure. Uh, very quickly, before I move on to the first year, uh, you're asking for the public's help, in effect, on this police search. What, what do you expect from that? Briefly? Well, one of the things that we did with the citizen committee is that we talked about establishing the criteria. What are we really looking for in a police chief? Given all the problems we've had over the years, given the last set of problems that we've had in this last year, what do people really want? And they set out on some criteria, and you can imagine what some of it is. We want somebody who has got some national experience and some credibility. We want somebody who knows how to work with all of the members of the uh, community, and our community is becoming more and more diverse. Well, we set those criteria out, we shared them with the public, and then we created a, a hotline, so to speak, in the mayor's office where citizens of the community can call in and give us their opinion about that criteria and others, and also give us specific questions that they want us to ask uh, these police chief candidates. And we're making a commitment that we're going to ask those questions uh, to those candidates and then report back to the public what their responses were. Uh, today uh, we uh, listed uh, two uh, numbers. I hope uh, that uh, six, we can six, share them seven, today. We're coming up right in a moment, I think, on the screen. 673-2984 and 673-3363. Well, I want you to know that before I left over here, the volunteers were already over there. They're waiting, waiting to take calls. In fact, the calls started coming in early uh, this afternoon. So people, people are interested. first heard about it, and they are calling. I mean, we thought we'd have you know, five or six of volunteers, the office is actually full of them, and people are calling, and they're giving us their opinion, and okay. they feel good that they have a chance to do that. We don't have a lot of time left, but we'd like to get to what you consider some of, to be some of your accomplishments in this first year. Well, Very quickly, if we can. Well, let me just share with you that uh, we set out on some promises uh, to uh, the public in my State of the City address. We talked about making the city of Minneapolis safer. We talked about supporting our families and our young people. Government reform. We talked about making it more convenient for businesses to work with the city of Minneapolis so they can do what they know how to do, which is create jobs. We had a whole litany of things that we said we were going to do, and I'm really pleased to tell you that we kept our promises. There are more police officers on the street. They're working closer with the citizens of our community. This summer for our young people, we gave them some alternatives to being on the street and getting in harm's way. We had something called Fat Summer, which I didn't know what fat meant, but it means something like cool. Mm -hmm. We did good things for our young people, had our parks and our schools buildings open well past 10 o'clock and it really had an effect you know on our crime rate 
government reform. We did many things to move the city of Minneapolis forward in, on the issues of uh, civil service reform. Our charter department heads, including our police head chief, had indicated that he can't fire people who do a bad job. We're going to change that uh, for City Hall. We've made good progress, and I'm pleased to let the public know that. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Okay. <laughs> Minnesota has been chosen to take part in a national effort to identify and study infectious diseases. The Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta will give the state $350,000 in the first year of the five-year study. State epidemiologist Michael Osterholm said the study is desperately needed. Uh, this particular program is an outgrowth of several national reports, uh, the first coming in the late 1980s, which outlined the substantial lack of resources and infrastructure that we have in this country to address not only the basic infectious disease problems of yesteryear, but a number of new and emerging infection problems that uh, as late as uh, several years ago we didn't even know existed. Dr. Osterholm will be on Almanac tomorrow night to explain what the state will do with the CDC grant. That's Friday night, tomorrow night on Almanac. Well, on Thursday night, we usually bring you a preview of some entertainment events with our arts correspondent, Melody Gilbert. Well, Melody's on vacation, but there's still plenty to do this weekend, including this play by the theater De La June Loon. It's Don Juan Giovanni, and it's a bit interpretive. Here's a look both in front of and behind the curtain. <laughs> Don Giovanni, and this is Don Juan. I'm supposed to seduce everybody. <clears throat> we're traveling from one woman to the next. That's where all the seductions take place. And... Well, that play runs through the end of January at the Theater de la June Loon in Minneapolis. Staying with the arts theme for a while, Rebecca Peterson joins us. She's one of the recipients of the First Bank Sally Ordway Irvine Awards, recognized for Rebecca's initiative in the arts world. Welcome to you. Glad you could come. Thanks. Rebecca, you're from Fergus Falls. You've brought arts to Fergus Falls in a renewed way. Tell us what you've done there and what, what brought you the award. Well, um, actually, the arts were in Fergus Falls before I got there, <laughs> but um, I was one of those people that recognized just how much talent there was in the community. We moved to Fergus Falls three years ago when my husband took an orchestra teaching position, which was a sign to me that the arts were healthy in Fergus Falls. Um, I got involved with the Center for the Arts about the time that the renovation project began on an old theater, and we're two-thirds complete and hope to open in 1995 while we continue to do programming in the community. And you've raised something like $700,000? $770,000. To refurbish the theater. That's right. That's an amazing feat in itself. Well, in a community the size of Fergus Falls, which is about 12,000, 
I think it's spectacular. We did get a McKnight grant for $125,000, but the rest of the funds have been all raised locally. And in terms of the theater, uh, or what will this allow the artists there to be able to do? Well, it gives the artists a home. We have a community orchestra that is always searching for a place to perform. We have a children's theater and a community theater, as well as other musicians in town that need a venue for performance. Um, there are other theaters, but not downtown, and they're busy with school activities and, and the community college activities, so we're really excited about providing that kind of a place for our artists. Is it going to be a challenge once the theater is restored and this money is spent to keep it operating in a, in a positive way? I mean, Well, of course, that's a, a concern for a lot of people, but we've spent a lot of time putting together a business plan, which includes renting the building to other places, a contract with the school district to do performances there. So we have a full calendar of events planned in addition to the things that we'll be doing. So I think the building will pay for itself and we know that the arts in Fergus Falls have managed to pay for themselves over the past few years. For those who don't know, Fergus Falls is in okay. northwestern Minnesota, uh, about right. 100 and miles from the Twin Oh, Center? it's a three hour drive, so yeah. about 160 <coughs> miles. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for being here, Rebecca. It's thanks a great project. Me. Thank you and congratulations. Thanks. Well, I tell you, tonight is Ron Hanberg's last night. We knew it had to come, and here it is. I think it shocks us anyway because it is his last night. When he first took this job, it was with the understanding that he would be here for just a year. He wanted to get this show up and running and then go back to his career as a novelist. That year has come and gone all too quickly. But this is not the first news operation that Ron Hanberg has walked away from. Four and a half years ago, he said goodbye to his colleagues at WCCL-TV, where he was general manager. He'd been there for more than 35 years. Well, we asked a friend of his from those years to do the commentary this evening. Here's Dave Nimmer. I think that the community ought to be grateful to Hanberg for several things. One, the idea for Newsnight Minnesota had been talked about for, for years, and nothing ever happened. It was planned for, it was discussed, and Hanberg made it happen. He put together a crew who could go out and gather the news, they could assess the news, they could write the news, they could produce the news, they could edit the news, and they could put the damn thing on the air. And not only that, they could do it Monday night, but Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. And that's a great accomplishment. Secondly, he gave a chance to put talking heads on the air people who could actually discuss issues and have a dialogue with each other and they could do it for more than nine or 12 or 15 seconds. And that's a wonderful idea, particularly in times when issues need to be discussed. I had to admit there was a night or two when I learned more about wind power than I ever needed to know in this century. Third, they delivered on the promise of cultural diversity. We all give lip service to it. But Newsnight provided an opportunity for people from different groups, different neighborhoods, different colors, different backgrounds to sit down and talk about issues that mattered. They got a chance to bitch about their leaders. They got a chance to complain about the community. They got a chance to offer suggestions. They got a chance to say things. And nobody else would give them that kind of exposure. And finally, I think Hanberg celebrated uh, gray hair. My friend Shelby has little touches of gray at the temples, which I know now he's trying to die. And Majors has flecks of gray in his hair. And you can see him sparkle once in a while. Well, Hanberg's outright silver. There's no way to hide it. You gotta deal with it. That man is middle-aged. And my, for one, like the hell out of that idea. Hanberg is middle-aged. I assume that with that comes some wit and wisdom, and there was a night or two that he could demonstrate that, by gosh, the years did pay off. So I'm grateful for that. And finally, I'm grateful that he's getting out of there. Uh, the man is my fishing companion, and he needs all the help and the training and the background he can get in a fishing boat. Hanberg does not take to fishing naturally. And I want him to spend more time on the contemplative part of his life, on the spiritual part of his life. Simply, he'd be a better companion in a boat. And that's what I want. 
Well, we should note that Ron will not be gone entirely. He has told us that he's going to be perched on our shoulders in spirit right. no matter what. And he has also consented to an ongoing uh, consultancy work for Newsnight Minnesota. This is uh, all a bit of a surprise, but uh, I, I do want to say very briefly that it's been a joy to be uh, part of developing Newsnight Minnesota. Uh, it's been a joy to work with the staff of Newsnight and of all the other people at KTCA. They've been wonderful and enthusiastic, and most especially, Carolyn, to you, who brings charm and intelligence to this set. Uh, it's been a great experience, and I'll continue to watch, and this program needs everybody's support. Um, and I hope it receives it. So to you and to everybody, thanks very much. I'll continue to watch, and it's, it's been great. Good night, Thank everybody. You. News Night Minnesota is made possible by the contributors to the Power of Two Campaigns Program Fund with major grants from the Blandon Foundation and the McKnight Foundation. Business reporting on News Night Minnesota is presented through a grant from Thunheim Santrizo's Public Relations, understanding business strategy and providing creative communications. Music